Uh, well, first of all, my name is David. I'm a developer advocate for Starknet, so I work for Starkware as well. So today I prepare a workshop, and please bear with me because this is so new that it just got deployed yesterday, like the new version of Cairo. So I wanted to show you the latest and greatest. I've been working all day because I said some hiccups in, in the tooling yet, but it's going to catch up. It's going to get better. But hopefully I'll be able to show you and deploy and all those stuff. Today, so let me just start share my screen. Uh, here, okay, give me a sec. All right. So I have here, you know, like a clean Ubuntu installation because I wanted to show you the whole thing from start. Um, so, you know, you usually start with VS Code and the first thing that I will do is that you can start, install the the extension for Cairo, so you can get syntax highlighting your code. So that's going to do first. Just so you can increase the font size. Uh, never know if you want to have to do this. View, appearance, zoom in, control plus, equal, control. What? Sorry, I'm in a Mac, but running a VM with Ubuntu, so it's a little confusing in the, in the shortcuts. Let's see if I can just squeeze it here. Uh, view. Where is it? Appearance. I mean, let me do one more. Is that big enough for you guys? Yeah, that's all. OK. Right, so you can just search for the extension. And it's going to be the Cairo 1 extension by Stackware. So I'm just going to install it. It's going to work by default with the latest version of the compiler. So if, you, if you're trying to work with the, let's say, with the Cairo version that is supported by now on mainnet, this extension is not going to work well because it's expecting the latest, the one that is activated yesterday uh, on testnet, which is the one that we're going to be used today. So it is now installed. So I can go back to my code. So what I'm going to do here in my terminal, first of all, I'm just going to create the, the project. Again, the font size terminal. I think it's here. Uh, preferences, unnamed. Uh, Text, where are you? It's custom font. Yeah. Uh, OK. Do 16. OK. Cool. So first of all, just going to create the project. Uh, sorry, going to install the compiler, right? The Cairo compiler. In this case, I'm going to use a project called SCARB which not only has the Cairo compiler, it also helps you to manage dependencies, right? If your smart contract has dependencies on different libraries, different smart contracts, now this tool also is able to manage that. So to install SCARB, let me go to the docs. And, all right, so this is the command. We go to SCARB. Starknet and all right. So basically, you can copy this command here, put it on your terminal. And what I'm going to do is just actually, I'm going to ask it to install a very particular version of the compiler. So you do that by passing this flag. So this is the latest version of this tool, just because so we use the compiler that is actually supported on the test set and not just the one on mainnet. Let me verify this, everything looks okay. This is the link, this is car. 
And this is the latest version. OK, so let's go for it. All right, so I think if I try to do version, it's not yet activated. Let me just close the terminal and open it again, or just source from my configuration file. In this case, C shell. Just so you can find the binary. So now I should be able to do SCAR version. And you can see that I have a SCAR comes from the latest 2.0.1 Caro compiler supported on testnet. So now with the SCARB, I can actually create a new project. So let's call it SCARB new, let's call it ownable, right? This is a smart contract that I'm gonna create here. So that should have created a new ownable folder that it has just a couple of files. So it has a configuration file for the compiler and it has like a sample smart contract for you. So I'm just gonna open this folder with VS Code and keep working from there. I think the font size, it's again small. Give me a second. Uh, I did it here in appearance, domain. And one more time, oops. I think it went too far. One less. Okay. So if I open this file, you can see it comes pre-built with a very simple Cairo. This case is not even a smart contract, it's just a regular Cairo program that you can use. So you can use Cairo just by itself, not for a smart contract. Uh, to verify that it works, I can open the terminal here. And I should be able to do a SCAR build and it creates a target folder with a compiled version. But we want to actually create a smart contract, not just a Cairo file. So let me start, look my notes. Uh, all right. Okay. So in on a start, to define a smart contract, you have to define what's called a module, right? So my module, I'm just gonna call this ownable, this smart contract. And to tell the compiler this module is not just a module, but a smart contract, you have to use what's called a macro with a specific attribute that is called, uh, so the macro is defined like this. And then the attribute that you, def that you use is the stagnant uh, contract. Okay, I think I need to. Right now, the configuration of a SCARB is expecting a vanilla Kyra. It's not expecting a smart contract. So we need to do a change in the configuration here. Basically, enable a plugin for a Starnet using this line. So for dependencies, I'm going to create. Darknet as a dependency. This comes uh, included in the in the compiler, so you have to enable it. And I'm gonna tell it to give me the latest one. All right, so it's 2.0.1. And I think that should at least the minimum required. Let me see what happens if I install this. Tomal intern. Okay, looks a little bit better. So what happens? Is complaining plugin diagnostic control is fine. Okay, so basically it's saying that sure you have a smart contract, but if you don't have a storage, you're not done yet, right? So we need to first define what are the storage variables of a smart contract, and you do that by defining a struct. Right, this is very similar to Rust. And this struct has to be called uh, uh, sorry. Storage. Yeah. That's what we call a storage. And it has to be annotated with this particular attribute that is called storage. Okay, so at least the error is gone. 
So for a smart contract, we're going to have a single variable, which is going to be what's going to be the owner of the smart contract, right? So I define it here, and then you can define the type. So we have a simple type that is called contract address. That basically is an alias for felt, which is a field element. And to be able to use this type, I, we need to make sure to bring into scope with the use keyword. So we're going to make bring this type uh, to scope like this. Contract address. Identifier not found. Try to build. OK, let me see. I think I'm missing something here. Give me a sec. They should be on the top of the file, the import, or in the module. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm missing here. It has to be at the very top. Okay. So we bring it into scope for uh, for the whole smart contract of the file, and then we make it available within the smart contract or within the module using super. Okay, we are good here. So next step, we're going to define a constructor. And the idea of this smart contract is simply to track who's going to be the owner and just to allow the owner to transfer ownership to someone else. And if someone else tries to transfer ownership, if it's not the owner, it should prevent that from happening. So I'm going to define the constructor which is just a function that you can call whatever you want. I'm just going to call it constructor. And this function has to be annotated as well uh, with the attribute constructor. Right? So that way, uh, the system knows that this is a special function that has to be called when we deploy the smart contract. Let's open the space here. Uh, OK, so this function expects to be passed a reference to the state, to the contract state, right? So it, it, it's, this way it's able to read and to write to storage. So to get the reference, you use the keyword ref. And then the variable that gets passed is the of type contract state, OK? Which is basically this storage being passed in a way that you, you can manipulate the values of it. Right? You can ask me any questions, so feel free to interrupt me. So at this point, and this is an error that I made at the beginning, I was trying to capture who the deployer is, right? The address of the deployer so I can define it at, at, in the storage. So I was doing this. I was actually getting a variable called deployer and then doing get caller address. Right? This way, this is a syscall. And to use the syscall, you have to also bring it into scope. Uh, and that syscall is in, it's in the Starknet. Yeah, Starknet, get color address, right? So in theory, this gives you back the address of, of the color, and then you can actually store it into the owner property of the storage struct. So you can do self dot uh, owner dot write, and you pass deployer. Okay, so far so good. Maybe I'm gonna leave it like this, and then I show you what was the issue that I have. Makes a little bit more sense. So okay, so now that I have the constructor, now I want to define what is gonna be the public interface of my smart contract because I need to have a function that allows me to transfer ownership. And I want to have another function that is just read-only that is going to give me back who the current owner of the smart contract is. So whenever I want to define the public interface of a smart contract, you have to define a trait. So I'm going to define this trait here outside of the module. So let's call it trait. I'm going to call it the ownable uh, trait. And a trait is like an interface, right? If you use it in another programming language. And this trait expects a generic, but it's gonna, it's gonna call it T. Now, to make this trait uh, particular to, sorry, I was supposed to make this outside. 
here at the top. Okay. So I have to also annotate this trade with a particular attribute called StarNet interface. Right? It's going to be the public interface of, of our smart contract. So here define the public functions, which are going to have two. One is going to go transfer ownership that is supposed to only be called by the owner. And the trade doesn't have implementation, just the signature. And the other function is going to get the view function called get owner. Okay. Now, the way that you define that a function can modify the internal state, what we used to call before an external function, is because it's going to be able to get a reference to the storage, right? Very similar to how the constructor actually gets a reference to the contract state. So that's how you know that this function is actually to use it. You have to send a transaction. You have to pay for gas fees. So let's call it self and then the type T, the generic. Later, when we implement this trade, we're going to actually provide this the same type that we use here. But for now, it's a generic. And, and that's it, right? Now, in the case of get owner, this is just a view function. It's only for read state, not to modify. So to make it that obvious, you actually, what you pass is just a snapshot to the generic type T, okay? And the snapshot is a way to uh, get access to a, a structure without getting ownership of it. So you cannot modify it. You can only read from it. And it's going to return, obviously, who is going to be the current owner, the owner with the type contract address. Any, any questions so far before I move on to the implementation of this trade? The rep self, that's new, isn't it? As of... Uh, Which one? The, the, just doing like rep self in the constructor, right? Is, is that new or has that always been out? That's, that's new. That is the new syntax that was made available yesterday in the testnet. That's why it is in the edge of the edge. <laughs> All in Cairo for a year. Like It's just gone through a lot of upgrades and... It's getting so much cleaner and ergonomic to write, and um, it looks beautiful compared to what I've seen it as. So, yeah, yeah, because the the issue that was before is that you can define a function as a view function, right? In the in the Cairo one version one, but you had to check at the runtime that no one is trying to actually modify the state. There was no way for the compiler to know that the body is not trying to modify the state. Now, by making this explicit that you actually pass in a reference to the state, you know that this function is allowed to modify the state. And you know that this function is not allowed to modify the state because it only gets a snapshot. So the snapshot cannot modify the state. You can only read from it. So now you make it super safe. Like if you try to do something that is not possible, the compiler is going to catch it very early on, much early on, even before you deploy it. So that's the main reason to have this. And it has also nice properties that you can actually consume this trade from other smart contracts. And it would also not only give you access like to the ABI of that smart contract, you can actually just directly just call these methods. So, okay, but you define the trade is just define the interface. Now you we have to define the implementation of this trade within our smart contract, okay? So the way to do that, we go now into the body of the smart contract. And we're going to define an implementation that in Cairo implementations have names. We're going to call it the ownable implementation, impl. And that is the implementation of this particular trade. Okay. So before I go any further, I need to bring this trade into scope within this module. So I'm just going to do here, use super ownable trait. Okay. And now I have to define the generic. And, and as I mentioned, the generic is actually the contract state, the same that the construction is receiving, the same that is actually represent the storage. So contract state. Why is it complaining? Right, so it's, it's now complete because we need to now implement the interface. 
So let me just copy the signature of these two things and implement them back here. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's start with the transfer ownership one before we go into, sorry. Okay, so now we know that this type T is actually contract states, no longer a generic. Now we define the correct type. So, okay, so let's see. What else? Okay, so this is passed directly by the compiler, but we also need to define who's gonna be the new owner. So let's define this as a new parameter, new owner of type contract address. And we can, uh, put that one, actually two, why is it complaining? Give me a sec. Contract state. Oh, okay. This might be because for this implementation to actually work within the smart contract, we have to annotate that in another attribute that is called external. I go one by one. Hey, what's that V0, the external? Yeah, yeah, so, you know, these functions get turned into selectors that you can call from other smart contracts. So this V0 is telling you how this string basically gets turned into a selector. What is the algorithm being used? And V0 is the way that we do it up until now. Basically, is the Ketchak hash of of this string. In the future, it might be possible to have more uh, different ways to calculate the selector, because right now you can define multiple implementations or multiple traits within the same smart contract. But if you have two methods or two functions with the same name, even in two different tra traits, you're going to have a collision of selectors. So that's the way V0 works. In the future, we're going to avoid that collision by having different versions of external, if that makes sense. That's good. This applies to the uh, read or view as well? The what, sorry? The, uh, the view um, selector or the, uh, the view macro, what am I trying to say? Like, so it's no longer it's no longer a view uh, macro anymore. Um, no. Yeah. So get get owner is what you used to call a view function, but now look at that it doesn't have any yeah. macro. Okay. Yeah. What you're saying that this the implementation of this trait is going to be the public interface of our smart contract. All right. So forget view function. It's not a thing anymore. Yeah, they, they exist, but now they exist just because you know it's been passed a snapshot. That's how you identify them. Okay. So again, this generic is the same contract state. Um, I wonder why it's complaining about this ref. Let me keep going and see if it changes. For now, I'm just gonna directly just put into storage self dot uh, owner dot right. Let's have here the new, new owner. Something very simple, no control of any kind. And and for the get owner, I'm just gonna return the same value, right? So very similar, but just gonna do read. Self dot owner dot read. And in Cairo, as in Rust, if you omit the semicolon at the end, it actually returns that value directly. So let me try to compile to see what errors actually come up. So let's see the error. Uh, it says that it's incompatible. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, of course, of course. When we define the trait, we only define that it had a single parameter, but it's actually expecting who the new owner is. So we have to define this as well. Does it make sense what I'm doing? 
that's why I was complaining because I was defining a, a new parameter here that it was not compatible with the trait that we defined at the top. So we, we were violating the interface. So in theory, this should satisfy the interface. So if I try to build again, it should work. All right, it's working. But as you know, I mean, we didn't want anyone to just say, hey, I'm the new owner, execute this, assign to me, right? We need to first verify that whoever is calling this function is actually the owner before we allow the person to actually change ownership. So let's see. We can capture the color of the smart contract by using this syscall that we imported before, get color address, right? And we can use assert just to verify that the color is the owner. So let's bring here the, let's say the current owner. Let's read it from storage first, so similar to how we did it here. And now I can compare both values with an assert. So I'm saying that, all right. To be able to move forward, the color should be equal to the current owner. Otherwise, show an error message. Like you're gonna have to fail the transaction, revert it and show this message in the logs. Uh, so color, not the owner. Yeah, makes sense. sense. So in the case of the owner, nothing, this is fine. Just read it from it and we're good. And okay, that's it. So cool. So we have defined those two public uh, functions. One very common pattern is that whenever you do a change like this, change of ownership, you're gonna emit an event, All right? So let me show you how do we emit an event of uh, the ownership has changed. So create the event, we are gonna use an enum. So let me go back here to the top. Let's define the event here. The top doesn't matter exactly where, I'm just gonna put it here. And I'm just gonna call it event, it's an enum. And of course this has its own special annotation that it's gonna be event, this attribute, but it has, oops. It's gonna have an extra one, derive, drop, and stagnant event. So this is how we define that this enum is actually an event, not just a regular Cairo enum, right? And in the body of the of the enum or the variance of the enum, we're gonna define all the types of events that we're gonna be able to emit. So one of them is gonna be the ownership transfer, right? You have to define the type. And the type is gonna be a struct or could be a, a scalar type. I'm just gonna define a struct just because whenever I, I emit an event, I want to emit who the current owner is and who the new owner is. So it's gonna be a new struct with two members. Um, so I'm just gonna give it the same name. I think it's a requirement to be called the same. And now we define the struct here below. This is struct right here. This struct is going to have two properties. Previous owner, which is type contract address. And then we have new owner, type contract address. Okay. Uh, let's see why it's complaining. Mm, contract type, the same event must be marked with event. Oh, somehow it changed this to external. So it'll be event. Okay, let me just close this for a moment. Cool, so this struct uh, needs to implement or have, be, have the same annotation applied to it. So we know that it's not just a regular struct, it's just one of the variants of the event. Cool, so now that we have the event defined, we can actually use it, we can actually emit it. So we can go back to the body of our function here. Once ownership is changed, we can actually call self and emit. And in here, we can define, we can create our struct 
uh, with the values that we went to provide. So the type of the of the enum is ownership transferred. And then we provide the struct. The struct is of type ownership transfer and has the values previous owner, which is going to be what we call the current owner. And then we have the new owner, which is the argument that we're getting from the function. Put it here so more space. Questions so far? And semicolon. So here I should be able to build and it builds fine. So events are a way, it's very going to be very useful for indexers, especially for the front end. And normally you have to define which ones are keys, which ones are values, which defines how the indexer is going to index the event. And the way to define which are going to be keys and values is basically with a new attribute called key. So I'm just going to make both of them keys, right? Because I'm going to be able to, oh my God, do the same. I want to be able to search any of those keys when finding the event. If I don't define this attribute, then it's not going to be indexed, but it's going to be a value of the event. All good. Now, to finalize here, this pattern where you collect who's calling the smart contract and then comparing to see if it's actually the owner is very common in smart contracts. So. Normally, you will extrapolate that into a private function where you perform that information. So let's move it out of the implementation. I'm going to create a new implementation only for private methods, right? Things that are not meant to be called from the outside world. So I'm going to call it private methods. And, you know, you have to define a trait. And we haven't defined a trait yet outside. There's a shortcut that you can use that is called generate trait. It basically does the opposite work. You define implementation and it generate a trait for you with all the bells and whistles required for the smart contract. So now I'm going to call this private methods trait. Um, and I define my private functions. Let's call one that's called only owner. Right, that's going to perform the check that we have done before. And this function, this private function, is not going to modify the state. It's just going to read from it. So I'm going to pass it a snapshot of the contract state. Right, same as a, as a view function. And in here, we do something very similar to what we have done here. We actually, actually copy this. Let's copy these three lines. And we paste it here. So let's check, get the caller, read from storage, compare both of them. OK, so now we can use the function here. Instead of doing it, you know, writing their duplication, I can remove all that. And I can say self, only owner. And that will do the same thing. Now, it's complaining because it doesn't know anymore who current owner is. So we need to bring this back at least to the body of that function right? because it's required for the event. And that's how you define your public interface different from your private implementation, OK? And I should be able to build. All good. Any questions so far? That's all my smart contract. What I want to do next is to actually deploy this to the testnet, right? And this is the part that I, know, I don't know if it's going to work or not. I'm going to give it a try. Um, because what I want to do, I want to create a wallet with Bravos and then being able to use that wallet for deployment. So if I go to Bravos, sorry, yeah, to Brave, I can find the extensions if I know where to find them, extensions. And I'm going to search for Bravos, Bravos Wallet. 
and I'm install it. Okay, I'm gonna create a new wallet. Let's give it a password. Hey David, is this that you prefer to deploy contracts to it through the uh, wallet user interface as opposed to from the CLI? So it's gonna be a combination. I'm actually gonna use the CLI, but the CLI is gonna be able to import uh, the private key of your wallet. The benefit of doing it that way, instead of trying to create a new account from the CLI, is that it's going to be very easy to keep updating your your smart wallet thanks to the the UX that Bravos or or Agent X provide, and it's much easier to keep track of how much money you have to pay for gas fees, right. Right? because it's just part of the interface. Yeah, totally agree. So, okay, I'm gonna go to Girly Alpha, and what's happening? Mm. Well, it's not allowing me. All right, it works somehow. I need to get some test tokens to be able to deploy my, my user account. So I'm going to use the, the faucet. Hopefully this works, the faucet. I'm just going to copy the address, say, hey, send me some test ETH to this account. And I have to check the fire hydrants and good. Send request. See, hopefully the faucet collaborates. Get it. Go put this transaction hash. The Stark scan or block spurrer. Go to testnet. Okay. Been accepted. Cool. So we should have now some money here. Yeah, 3.83. So we can now deploy this to Gurley. Deploy our user account. I don't know how much time left I have, so please let me know if the next speaker needs to come up. Just kind of continue here. And okay, so the wallet is being deployed. So now we can actually use it with the CLI. Uh, so the CLI that I'm gonna use now is not gonna be Cairo Lang, which is the one that we have used up until now. It's gonna be st starkly. It's, just, it's a new CLI created by the community. It's actually built with Rust instead of Python. And I actually quite like it so far. So to install it, we can go to Starkly, Starknet. Ether maybe? Give me a sec. Anyway, I have the command here next to me. So to get Starkly, I'm gonna run this command. Hopefully I can paste it here. Right, this is how you get Starkly with curl. And we need to add this binary to our path. So I'm just gonna copy this, open my seashell. Mm, C S H C, right? Yeah, open. And at the very end, I'm actually gonna uh, just gonna copy this and replace this part with this new path. Copy. Do I need home? I think so. Paste. Well, this is home actually. Okay. 
So if this is working fine, I should be able to close it and source it. CSHRC. And if I do now starkly version, it's not found. What did I do wrong? At home, stably being maybe, maybe I'm gonna close this uh, terminal. Terminal, maybe. Sorry, what? That's what I was thinking. I thought you just had to restart the terminal for it to take effect. Let me try to install this again to see. Manually add home. I'm just going to add this as is. Set of home. Paste. Let me try now closing this. And just going to close the terminal. Open again. Not showing up. Oh, I know why. Because what this thing installed is starkly up, similar to Rust up. So it's, it's a manager for the CLI. So this is how you actually keep updating it. So if I run this command, it's actually going to now install the latest version of the CLI. Right. So I need to start start a new session. So I'm just going to close this again and open it just to get out of completion. So now I should be able to, yeah. Now the CLI is working, 0.1.2. So Starkly is what we use to communicate with the Starknet to declare, deploy, and all that stuff. So we need to do the integration. So we're going to import the private key from Bravos into our project. So let me go back to the folder, ownable. Mm -hmm. OK. OK, OK, cool. So step one, I have to define uh, who the signer is going to be. So with that, just go do a starkly signer key store from key. And it's going to create a new file that's going to call it signer.json, which is going to be an encrypted file that is going to have your private key and your public key as well. So let's see. All right, so it's going to ask me for the private key of the wallet that I want to import. So I can go to Bravos and export show private key. All right, so I'm just going to copy the private key that I have here. And I'm just going to paste it here. And now I'm going to provide a password just to encrypt this file. So this file is going to, is going to be a plain text file for your password. So provide that password. So all right. So you can see I have a new file here. You see that the private key is not visible anywhere because the file itself is encrypted. So this is a good practice. To verify that the, all the information is being stored correctly, uh, I think you can do, let me see, stack lead signer, just checking the documentation on the side. Yeah, you can do stack lead signer key store inspect and then provide the file signer.json. When you provide the password to decrypt it, it gives you about the public key, right? So it ends on EE7. So let's compare with the actual wallet. So just make sure that it's the same. Yeah, it is seven, right? So it's working correctly. So because of a kind of abstraction, there's a separation between who the signer is and who the account is. So we have defined the signer. So now we have to define the account. 
So the account we have to create it manually because right now there's an issue with the Star Starly that it's not allow you to do it automatically, but it will. So it's going to be the account.json file. And I'm just going to copy this structure. Again, this is something that we do manually now, but eventually it's going to be automatic. Paste. Right? So this file basically tells Starly how are you going to be signing transactions using the, the private key. So in this case, say, hey, use the, just the regular signature from OpenSampling, and then you have to define the public key of your smart contract and the class hash where it was uh, defined and the wallet address, right? So the public key, we know where to get it from. It's actually this one right here. So I'm just going to replace it. Uh, copy. Right. Uh, the wallet address, we can get it from Bravos and just copy from the top here. Right. Rep uh, here, replace this value. And the class hash, we need to get it from a block explorer, right? So we can get the address. We go to a block explorer. And this is the class hash. So we're going to copy this and replace this value. So in theory, we need we have everything now to be able to you know the de de uh, declare, deploy, and invoke using our Bravos wallet as the actual smart contract wallet behind every transaction that we do. So let's do now. Uh, let's let's declare it. Let's declare our smart contract that we just compiled. So we can go do, do a stugly declare and we pass the file or compile. Uh, okay, I realized that we need to change something in the config because we need a JSON file. And that's because we are missing here a couple of configurations. Let me just add it now. A second, okay. So we need this Cairo, and we provide here Sierra replace IDs equals true. And then we also need target dot stagnet contract Sierra equals true. Let me check Sierra replace IDs true target target contracts here. OK, so if this is working, if, if I compile again, should get the JSON files that I need. OK, now I get the right files. Right, this is the file that I was actually needed to declare. So now I can actually go back to Stugly, do declare. And we need to define, first of all, which file. So this one is in target, dev, ownable. Okay, this is the file we're going to declare. And then we define which compiler version, which is going to be the latest one, 2.0.1. Then in which network, we're going to go to the testnet, so currently one. Then we define, okay, who's going to be the signer and who's, what's going to be the account for the, for the declare, uh, declaration. So the signer use the flag key store and you provide the file signer.json that we have here in the root project. And now we define the smart account, the Bravos account. OK, so let me see. Starkly declare the artifact, the compiler version, which network, curly one, the signer, and the account. So this should work. Fingers crossed. So we need to provide the password that we use to encrypt the signer, right? And OK, so this is the transaction. We can just copy and take a look in a block explorer. Let's check it out here. All right, and it's already accepted on L2. You can see how fast now Testnet is with the new upgrades. It's just in seconds. It's faster than I can actually go and copy paste. 
So, okay, so what we need is the class hash for deployment. So I can do now the deployment, it's very similar. Starkly deploy, and we provide the network, uh, girly one, we provide same, which is a signer, and, and who the account is. This is because we have to pay for the, the client and deploying. Account, account, JSON. And now we provide also the class hash. You have to pay class for hash. Too, not just deploy, right? For both. Yeah, for both. That's why for both we have to define the signer and the account just to pay. Uh, so this is the class hash that we just declared. And if we had any arguments in our constructor, that's what we define it as well. But right now we don't have, we don't have one uh, constructor because this is just passed directly by the compiler. So that's why this should be enough to deploy. Let me double check network, girly one, key store, center, JSON, account, account, okay. Let's see. Again, the password to the crypt designer. And let's check this transaction. I've already accepted on L2. So in theory, it was deployed to this address. So let's copy this. I think it takes a bit for the smart contract when you deploy it. But you know what? Let me open Voyager. I find that it's working even better than StarScan with the new version. Let me switch to testnet. And let's search for this address. OK, it's able to find it. And this is our smart contract in theory. Let's see. Yes, that is the get owner contract. Uh, and as you can see, if I query the hex, we get this value. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but it's not the value that we define. It's not the value for the address of our smart contract or, or wallet, right? It's that with 036. And this start with 041. This is what I found out the issue was just before we started is that the problem is here. When you try to collect the get caller address, I was thinking that I was getting the user account that I'm deploying. But what I'm actually getting is the address of the universal deployer who's actually doing the deploying for me. So I need to make a change. I cannot trust this in the constructor because it's giving me the universal deployer. I will need to actually pass as an argument who the owner is. Right? So I will have to ditch this line and simply just provide it myself. So that's just a so, call since, it, uh, since language has evolved? Would you say? I don't know if this is on purpose. This is it like it's supposed to be. Maybe it is not supposed to be. I don't know. I need to ask. I just find out like a five minutes before we, we got here. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But with this change, if I I will have to declare it again, deploy it, and it will give me the right value. Right? I don't I don't gonna repeat the whole process because you, you saw it how it works. But that's basically it. So I just show you how the new syntax of Carol one using trades for the public interface. How do you define the storage with a struct? How do you find events? Uh, how do you implement the public interface? And how do you define private methods that are not meant to be called from the outside? I show you how to inst install a SCARP, which is the compiler, Starkly, which is the new CLI for Starknet, and how to integrate your actually Bravos account into Starkly. Because the benefit is that now you can keep track here of the balance that you have for future deployments, and you can actually see all the activity of the things that we have done, right? So this is the deployment of, of our smart contract we just deployed now.
That's it, guys. Questions for me? How do you find this new version of uh, Cairo? If you have any knowledge of the previous one. It's looking good. It's looking a lot like Rust, whereas it used to be a lot like assembly and much more lower level and difficult to use. So this, I mean, just since I saw you start in Denver, this looks so much different than it was. That yeah. Than yeah. That, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a little bit more verbose. But I like it that it's more explicit and it, it makes the compiler much more powerful, which is one thing that we like a lot about in Rust as well. It looks like you had to do a few steps to get the account sort of set up, like to declare and then to put a contract. Um, maybe I'm just using like hard hat or something like that for Solidity. Is there, um, I don't know, any plans to make that process just a little faster or sim simple? You mean for for the declaring, deploying, and uh, all that part? And, uh, just like the account JSON and the signer.json part, it seemed like we kind of had to go to start scan. We had to call some CLIs and so on. Yeah, you know, you can use you cannot use hard hat as well. I've never used it, but I know there's a plugin to use it starting with hard hat, and and that way you can actually do testing uh, with with hard hat as well. I like this way just because I know that for the Stark lead, if I were able to find, let me find the documentation so I can show you. And I increase font size. Okay, cool. There is, okay. So in theory, there is a command where you can just fetch all the information for your account. You know the account of JSON that we create manually and you have to find all the information bit by bit? This will do it all for you and you only have to provide the address, okay. right? This is right now in a PR, so it's not yet merged, so it doesn't work. But as soon as this is merged, this part is gonna be simpler to do. You can also create your own uh, account just for deploying instead of having to connect with Bravos and all that. I just like to connect both. I think find the long term is easier that way. Short term, yes, yeah, a little bit more work to do the integration. Any more questions? I don't have any, but this was super helpful, David. Thank you. For You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, I'm done. What should I do? Uh, why don't we, Matt, you need to set up as well, right? Yeah. Um, email. Yeah, David, I think you're good. I think uh, David, you sign off. We appreciate you. You're welcome. Forward to Safe Matt. Bye.